very good evening to all the session which is about to start is titled as my space design talk and the speaker for the session is renowned architect mr dean ducros a passionate green proponent he graduated from sir jj school of architecture and later joined architect gerard de guha in goa he also became a partner in a firm called natural architecture working on cost effective housing in a very lorry baker approach using waste building materials and innovative design he is the co-founder of mosaic and his current emphasis is on urban interventions sustainable principles and conservation please join me in welcoming architect dean dickros Good, af <clears throat> Good afternoon, friends, and uh, <clears throat> excuse my throat today, so uh, it's a little scratchy. <clears throat> uh, I'm basically going to share with you my own experience of actually being influenced by Baker. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't have the opportunity of working with Baker directly, uh, but my partner worked with Baker for some time. and. Um, initial seven, eight years of practice was in a very Baker style of approach of actually design and build and use local materials, lose local craftspeople and create an architecture that connects to the people. So we, over the years we've trained over 150 masons who have now become contractors and, and taking this message forward. And it's only when I was invited to actually come and speak here that I realized how much Baker has actually influenced my own life and, and direction in a very subtle way. Because looking back at what Baker has, when most people think about Baker, it's, they think about you know, the, the Baker sort of uh, exposed brickwork, the rat trap barn, the filler slabs, and the wild and wacky buildings that he has. But Baker's philosophy went much beyond that into a certain simplicity and a certain human values in which he put into his architecture. I had fortunately the opportunity to actually host Baker for almost a week, he and his wife in, in Goa. They stayed at, at my house. And <clears throat> at 4 o'clock in the morning, Baker would disappear. He'd get up early and he'd, he'd go start walking everywhere and making sketches. And this is the sketch actually of, of the little chapel in front of my house and uh, the house in the background, which I keep in memory and I keep as my letterhead for the house. Uh, and of course, there are many other sketches that he made in Goa, which I also treasure. And I realize that the, the, the sensibility of Baker has actually come from his ability to record everything he sees. Generally, we record through photographs. But the simple act of actually drawing everything he saw you know, ingrained it in his memory forever. And that, and that and allowed us, as, as observers of Baker's work, to actually also be sh have that share. So when I joined uh, Gerard, we, we formed an office together initially. I just worked for him for six months, then joined him as a partner. And we started working in a very Baker style. We had this little uh, place that we rented, a little concrete box almost. And uh, we had to do it up. So we asked the, the landlord, can we do up this house? And he said, sure. And we took out all the doors and windows. And like in a Baker style, we wrapped the whole building around with, with exposed brick. All the doors and windows were eaten up by white ants. And that's the outside of the building. We called ourselves natural architecture because we work in a very natural style. We just very straightforward. Whatever you do is low cost, use whatever appropriate materials. So our initial work was actually in this Baker style of using the, the brick jollies, recycling materials, all the old metal, steel. We put the old grinding stone. <coughs> that's our little reception area, the China mosaic in the area. And all our early architecture was actually responding to idiosyncratic needs of clients. But at the same time, being aware of the thing that we're working in an area which has a very different architecture from Kerala. It had a traditional architecture that, that was 
Portuguese in the way. So we tried to capture these little elements in the architecture itself. Of course, ever so often we got influenced by, by Baker's work, the columns as well. And laterite's a very popular material in Goa, so we used a lot of it. And we recycled everything from old flooring, doors and windows, and of course the filler slab you can see all over the place. So like this, we, we eventually built about 60 houses on our own, each one completely different from the other. <clears throat> each one experimental and a lot of detail responding to each client's need and innovating along the way. So like this is a ferro cement window which we did, which is everything, the, the awning, the grill, the, the, the ventilator, only the wooden shutter is the only alien element. Uh, and we recycled materials, we, all the old columns and doors, windows we put into the building. <clears throat> and taught people to actually build now in arches, vaults, domes and masonry. We hardly use any concrete in our buildings. Uh. <clears throat> we also worked with the traditional architecture of Goa. How do you recycle old buildings? How do you preserve them? So in certain buildings, just stripped off the plaster, keep, kept it exposed, and added elements to it that would respond to tradition. So a lot of the features are actually new features, but we respond in an innovative way. So this, of course, is an old, a part of an old house, but it's a new room in the house. So it's, but we look at the old architecture and respond to that and respect the traditional architecture of it. This is another, uh, it's an old uh, house where we decided that we, we have to preserve the house. How do you add another floor? So all we do is simply lift up the roof and uh, put another floor, slip in into it. It's now become a center for child development in Goa. So simple, innovative, a very direct approach, which Baker, I'm sure, would have approved of. And in our housing projects, we also responded that we need to express the individual. Every one of a baker's houses is completely unique. So even in a housing complex, you cannot afford to have identical units. You need to express the uniqueness of each person. So in this housing complex, every unit is different. You enter to a big gateway, you, <clears throat> you move to this, the space, and you, each unit is unique in the sense it's got its own little staircase, its own little courtyards, and a very different planning in each. So he's, over the years, we built a number of these smaller housing complex, but each one with a unique sense, and of course, using the local laterite material, which is, you can dig out anywhere and you get laterite and you can build with it. Uh, and whatever we built, of course, it, we made sure that we added enough detail into the buildings, having fun along the way. <clears throat> and as we went along, we've, we've now built close to 400 houses. And so this was about 15 years ago, we started beginning building larger and larger houses. So this is a house for about four people. It's got a spa built into it. Uh, the, the people were from Kerala also, so we had a slight Kerala sort of thing to it. Uh, this is a house for two people, uh, which we got the stones for. So the moment you get successful, you get carried away with this thing that we have to now go on this complete roll. And it's an enormous house for just two people. And this is a house for one person. I don't know, it's very embarrassing for us now to say it, but this is a house for Vijay Malia, <clears throat> which is about 25,000 square feet. It's got four swimming pools in it. That's the entrance to it. <clears throat> and it's, it keeps on going on and on. It's about 200 meters long. It goes on and on into this thing. We had a lot of fun doing the house. Uh, and had all these gardens and pools and everything around. <clears throat> And that looks onto the sea over there. <clears throat> so this house we built for 11 crores. Yeah. You know, this was on this roll where we were really doing well. We had a large office, very happy and proud of the project. And uh, immediately after this house, we were asked to, this is after doing many years of you know, low-cost housing, we were asked to do a low-cost house. Yeah. And suddenly we realized that, oh gosh, we've, we've forgotten how to do a low-cost house. Yeah. So now we had to relearn our architecture. But we did a low-cost house for 11 lakhs. And we got the people involved in the house. So the man of the house went out and started buying materials. The woman started decorating the house. So he recycled material, all the old coconut wood, whatever you could get from old stackyards. Again, the lady decorated the place. The boys of the house you know, put all their old stuff together. So the, like the bathroom, for example, they used their old CDs. That the scooter handle became the tab. The, the skateboard became the shelf. And the whole, everyone started getting involved in the whole construction of the house. And we felt so much better with that. At the end of the project, 
Uh, the owners of the house called our family over for dinner. Uh, they put a shawl around me. Um, <clears throat> the wife cooked some wonderful food. One of the sons wrote a poem, the other wrote a song. And I must confess that Malia did nothing of the same. Yeah? <clears throat> so I suddenly realized that you know, we have to stop these rich people's houses. We have to get back our own sensibilities and only build houses for people who really want, as first homes, to make a difference. So we started back again in a low-cost mode, but of course, slightly larger houses, but houses which actually responded to the client's need much better. This is a house which actually broke into three houses, the three different pavilions disconnected from each other. So that's the entrance pavilion with the, with the garage, the staff room on the side, the guest room uh, above, then the living pavilion, which again, you can see, you can see the kettle columns. So we recycled everything that we, we could find, and uh, we just bit, started building pavilions here. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not going back. Anyway, so yeah. So that's, that's like living, everything opened out. Like, and we suddenly realized that actually the architecture, traditional architecture of Goa, is not as sensitive and sensible as the architecture of Kerala. So we were influenced strongly by the openness and, of the Kerala architecture, creating more pavilion-like structures than the much more enclosed structures that we see in, in Goa. So that's, that's the bedroom pavilion, and it's this, it's disconnected by this little passage. So instead of doing a veranda on the edge, like a lot of Kerala buildings, we did verandas between buildings. Yeah. So they, it was semi-open space that actually was bridged buildings together. We don't have too much of a security or privacy problem in Goa. So, so all our buildings started responding to the openness that needed, using the dormers that you see so much in Kerala. and creating a, this open architecture that just flowed through. So this space also, in you know, the kitchen, the dining, the living, the bedrooms, even the bathrooms actually flow one into the other, and little loft-like spaces, and very simple um, umbrella-like roofing systems that covered the architecture. So we started building a lot of these structures which actually responded to the need for openness, creating semi-open spaces, and like a kettle architecture, a generous roof that acted like a, like a sky almost over, a protective sky over the buildings here. That's the inside. And the living room space is as open as possible. With every project, we started getting more and more daring. Luckily, this client was also from Kerala, of course, the house is in Goa. So he's very happy to even use Kerala carpenters to come. And so we got carpenters from Kerala to come over there. And it's got a full water harvesting system built into it. That's why you don't see any gutters the side. They harvest the water and they take it through. And it's, again, a very transparent building that we create here. <clears throat> so these are buildings which responded. And it's a fairly recent house where we, rather than do a typical sort of trussing system, we did a cross-frame trussing and created these pavilions which, <clears throat> which look into the sky. This is my partner's house come office, which is just next to our office. So we started more recently to use, of course, the, the insulated metal sheeting, which is extremely effective rather than the Mangalore tiles. But keeping in mind the, the need to have an architecture that responds uh, climatically, responds also uh, to a traditional approach to architecture. More recently, of course, we, we clearly look at roofs which are south facing. So we keep our buildings you know, solar ready, as we call them. We're able to take solar panels in it at any point of time to ensure. So all our buildings now make sure that we have a, a very good south-facing roof ready to, to put on any energy systems uh, into it. That's the building. In our institutional work, uh, we, we work a lot with institutions. This is the Thomas Steff and Konkani Kendra. We use the, the courtyard as, as a central feature in traditional architecture, even in Kerala. You find the courtyard is a very important uh, factor that holds everything together. It's an open space. But it, it bonds all the functions. But we make sure that each function is actually unique, uniquely expressed. So you can see clearly you know, the library block, the, which are the stacks over there. You, there's the classroom blocks. There's the administrative block. There's residential block. And each has a totally different character in terms of the size of the windows, proportions, and each one responding in a different way uh, to the needs. That's the central space there. This is the Palotti Institute for Philosophy and Religion. Again, with the same basic principles, of, of using a traditional architecture, uh, responding 
to the need. So here, even the windows have giant brass rod, and all the window shutters open just with one, almost like a, like a sacred sort of opening of the windows. One move opens all the windows together. That's the entrance. That's a grand staircase, which acts like an amphitheater as well. And everywhere, there's little reference to the past of, you know, how do we actually show that, almost pretend that the building has been here for many years, even though it's a fairly new building. Oopsie. So just back one slide. Um, so this is, the, this is the cathedral in Karwar, just south of Goa. Uh, it's a thousand capacity cathedral. So we decided to actually make a building that responded to the Roman amphitheaters. Yeah. So Christianity started in the Roman amphitheaters, and we decided we must mimic the, uh, the amphitheater. So it's a building that steps down. As you move through, you come to a central thing. But more than that, it's a building which can respond to different sizes of congregations. So the small central portion is when you have your, your daily mass, and then it moves on to a weekly mass. And then the more festi festive masses that you have over there, the building can slowly fill up without it feeling empty at any point of time. And when you do have the Christmas and New Year's mass, the stage actually moves over here to the entrance there, and the open ground is used. Uh, but unlike most cathedrals, it's not symmetrical. It's asymmetrical with the entrances to the side. So we created an asymmetrical entrance uh, to the building, and this giant roofing system that covers it. But the walls are non-structural. The walls only define the edge of the building. And the structure actually rests on these tree-like structures. It just comes up and they float the roof above it, uh, and a skylight that wraps around the whole building. And the columns representing, of course, the apostles in Christianity. I mean, the, the tree-like structures representing the apostles in Christianity. This is the um, library building on Hampi. Uh, this is a 50,000 square foot building, and it's all built of stone. So we use, reuse the traditional system of uh, using, of course, a traditional plan of creating a cruciform sort of shape, which had a central courtyard, and used adding the gopurams to it. The gopurams are actually wind towers, so you hydrate the air at a high level, you take in hot air, you cool it down with water, and you take it down to the wind towers, and that's the structural system, stone columns, stone roofing systems, in the traditional way of using it. So you're using it local material and using local craft abilities to actually build it. Yeah. That's the building, and that's, you can see the giant veranda. It's a very deep veranda, so it cuts off all the light and heat that normally would come into the building. <coughs> this is a monastery for Spanish nuns in Goa. Here we planned, they wanted a monastery to last 400 years. And the only way you can make a monastery last 400 years is not to use steel and concrete, because those materials deteriorate in 7,500 years. So the whole system is actually fully masonry. We even proposed that the services would run through a duct they could have, and a complete, uh, even brick vaulted roofing system. Unfortunately, the, the nun said, you know, we, it's not looking gone enough. So we added a traditional, of course, metal and, and tile roofing system. It, but all the other details, more or less, are the same. That's it. The school we're working on in Bijapur, again using brickwork, but brickwork in a very different fashion. Bijapur is, has a very good quality of bricks. Bijapur also has a very high wind velocity. And it's a very dry climate. So we said, what if we create these wind towers again that will hydrate the air, cool it down, and then let it into the building? So we created this plan, which is just a, a sort of grid plan, which has flexibility. So only the columns are fixed, and all the walls are movable. So you can actually recreate your configuration of classrooms, labs, administrative spaces, uh, the way you like it as it's growing over the years. Yeah. <coughs> And that's the basic schematics of it, taking in hot air at a high level, hydrating it, so the brickwork is local. And the roofing system of panels made out of recyclable stuff, which you can just make it out of any roofing system that lets light and air out of the space. You cool it, you let it in, and all the partitions are soundproof partitions, which can be shifted around. So that's what the school would look like when complete, roughly. As we became more successful as architects, we started getting into projects, initially uh, hospitality projects, which are low cost in nature. And uh, a lot of these projects you know, started getting celebrated because they're fairly unique. Most hotel projects express this thing of, of a lot of luxury items, like you know, fancy marbles and fancy sort of finishes and you know, gold plated taps and everything. But this is a very low cost approach. Since they, they knew we work in low cost styles, how do you actually get a low cost architecture to make it look luxurious? So this hotel project, of course, became one of the 100 best small hotels in the world um, when it was built. 
It's a free-form hotel, just built on top of a hill. To build the hotel, we just excavated the pool. So all the rock from the pool was used to build the building. So it's, it was on top of a hill, so the getting the trucks up was very difficult. <clears throat> and we, again, we tried to recall the, the traditional systems of building. We, using the arches, you can see uh, the little details of the window. So the windows also didn't have wood in it. We just rebated the stone, made light metal frame, put the glass inside. And that's the pool you see. And we saved all the trees. That's why the building is completely free from. Whenever you see a tree, we take a turn. You see another tree, you take another turn. And incorporate, that's a detail of windows. There's only one concrete column in the whole building. And all the wood for the roofing is coconut wood. Coconut wood is very cheap. It's a renewable source. It's like bamboo also. You can grow it very fast, and you all know it better than me in terms of how great coconut wood is the material. It can last 100 years if it's treated well. And it's a very great material to use. Yeah. So that's the other column in the building. Again, where we recycle all the tiles you know, for the tables. That's the dining area. And you can see the kettle columns. And the kettle columns, again, used. Here we had four columns, two tall and two short columns over there. And we didn't know what to do. So we just simply we had an arch that came down. And I want to jump even lower. And it just responded to the thing of just being practical about it. And I, I miscalculated, of course, how much a column load can take. So the moment it started loading the roof, the, I could see cracks coming in the column. And then I looked at, at what the Kerala architecture does. And just, I just put simple steel straps around the wood. And having a steel strap, because wood, the first failing is splitting of the wood. The moment you put a steel strap, you can double the bearing capacity of the column. So just that little traditional detail that I learned from what is, happens in Kerala just helped me in, in taking the load to double the capacity. <clears throat> I'll go back. Yeah, this is, a, this is the dome. It's about 11 meters in diameter. We built it in four days here. Yeah. Four days, there's no concrete in it. It's only brickwork and mud and a plaster on top. We just do a simple steel arm, and we kept on building it ring by ring and went up to the top. And, so we, and we taught people. Now people can actually know how to do these simple domes. Yeah. Oops, yeah. back again. Yeah. So every room is completely different. So there, there are three other domes in the space. This is one of the, and every room is unique in terms of its character. So that's an open brick dome. That's a star room over there. So we, so we decided to make themes of it. Back, oh yeah. So the star room, it goes into the, the windows, the mirrors, everything in star shape, the sun room. So, so basically, we had a lot of fun in, in trying to you know, re reinterpret the themes and respond to it in some way. So little details. You know, even the window becomes like a ray of sun. <coughs> the moon room, and the little details we put into it, the sea room. And again, with all broken tiles, waste materials, simple ISPS floors, is the earth and fire room. A more recent addition is a, it's a Nubian vault. It's just a simple brick vault that leans against the end of the thing. It's an open-ended thing. And of course, we added a little ferro cement cap to it. So it's simple butterfly doors that open out to the view below, and that's the inside of the room. Awesome. A little details. There's another project, again, in a similar style. Here we decided that was an outward-looking hotel. It's an inward-looking hotel. So initially, we called this country courts, because a series of courtyards, and each one of different shapes, square, star, moon, round, and like a little street, like a village street that you walk through the space. And you come to little courtyards, and each each room has its own little private courtyard as well. <clears throat> and the insides, again, a very simple IPS flooring, um, wooden roof, so domes. Another hotel, again, which is Posada Thoma. Here we decided to respond to the traditional elements of uh, geographical elements of Goa, of, of sea, of uh, uh, fields, of hills. So all the buildings were responding to that sort of thing. So we created a central pool. <clears throat> And you have the sea rooms which, which move uh, around this pool and responding in some way to the, the sea elements yeah, in it. And the field rooms, again, responding in a certain way to the details of uh, where you handle railings, the windows to the fields, even the inside, the terracotta floor, bamboo furniture, the hill rooms of you know, solid stone, darker wood and colors. 
That's the restaurant. So the whole thing was a discovery. Every room is unique, and there's a constant discovery of different things. And you can see the Baker influence coming out in, in all of this work. Yeah. So, and Baker's work was also this excitement of you never know what is going to happen around the corner. So you try to use the same sort of approach to, to have this excitement as you move through. That's the entrance gate, like a palm leaf to the place. It's a more conventional building, which is called Coconut Creek, so the hotel close to the airport. It's in a coconut grove with a creek running through. And uh, it's a pavilion-style hotel. But again, we, in a hotel project, you always have the services, which are a big problem. So we decided to put the services under the main building. So all the kitchen and, and the staff areas and everything sat in this giant plinth under the main building of there. So everything is hidden behind. You can't tell it at all. And on top is the pavilion, the living, I mean, where the restaurant and the reception and everything is sitting over there. And the room sat in these little blocks, uh, 10 of these blocks with an AC room down and a pavilion room above. And that's the block. And that's the pavilion room above. Mm. <clears throat> and as Benny also described in his lecture, we used, like the kettle of the fan shape roof, they're not parallel rafters. They fan out from a central point to the sides. Eh? So every little while, we, we change our style of architecture. This, this hotel project had three mango trees on the site. And we decided we take the mango leaf, respond to the tree, and we create these mango leaf-like windows. And it's a multi-level restaurant that you have. And, uh, different, and this one staircase that actually joins the, all the levels of the restaurant. The inside of the building is about 40 rooms. Uh, we decided not to use wood also, because we don't get renewable wood over there. So it's all metal work and cement board work in the building. It's again around this pool. So not, we're not only architects, but we also in, we do interior design and product design. So we design everything right down to the fabrics, the lighting, the furniture. Everything is done in-house in the office. So once, sometimes we change our style completely. Like we started changing our style, we started working on a build. This is a, a house for an artist friend again, where we, we again use a very free form approach to the architecture, creating just these three giant concrete walls that interconnect. And the whole northern face of the building is done with perforated metal. The northern face, you don't get a direct rain and sun. So we just did this perforated metal on the whole northern face that lets in a very nice light. This is for the Taj. In Goa, it's an Ayurvedic spa. So we actually came down to Kerala and we started studying all the traditional temples of Kerala and how do we actually get the essence of Ayurveda in, into a, a new spa building. So you have the deep stum, of course, outside. It was an existing sports complex, which we gutted completely. And we decided we need to respond in some ways. So we realized in the Kerala temples, there was a light gradation, there was a scale gradation as you moved through things. So things were taller when you entered. And when you moved through, there was, of course, the place, the Otla, the place where you rested. Because you don't get a foot massage in the temple, but we added that. So basically, it was a responding to traditional, simple style of movement. And everywhere, there was an underfoot experience, the textures we used on the floor, the change in light levels that we had as you move through. So we created, before this, the actual massage room, we created this hall of contemplation. So on one side, you have light coming, just that you have light coming off the water tanks and entering the temple, the back of the temple complexes. We created this thing where. <coughs> Water just bounced off the water and entered into the space. And the inside wall, which is on the other side, was lit with diyas. And then you enter, of course, the, the rooms, which are done in an earth, air, fire, water thing. So the inside wall is just lit with light diyas. And the massage rooms connect to the outside. And the whole outside of the, temp of the spa complex is also lit up like a temple uh, jali. On the outside. So every evening they light up the whole thing. So it's almost like a ritual. So there's a certain sort of sacredness that we build into the spa. <clears throat> More recently, we work a lot in sensitive areas, eco-sensitive areas, whether close to the sea or in the jungle. So we always have this challenge of how do you build an architecture which is responsible in its way. So this is an existing house which they wanted to convert into a hotel, and they wanted to add four new rooms to it. And being in CRZ area, we could only add these little pavilions out on the outside. So these wooden pavilions, we look at the Japanese architecture, which responds very well to, to this, the sensitivities of using a lightweight material, and a material that can be taken away easily. So since we, we did the interiors in a very Jap style, and uh, since there are four cabins, we did it again in the themes of you know, winter, summer, autumn, fall. So every room responded to that season in some way, the way we handled the furniture. We even got a Japanese 
poet to write the haikus for that particular season. So every room responded in that, to that particular theme uh, in the detailing of it. Uh, this, is, this is on an island, again a project which we know only allowed to build six months of the year. So we decided to do a modular system of construction. So creating panels like these little panels of two feet by eight feet panels which you can put together. So every season you can keep on changing the configuration of the room. But there's no plinth, you just put sand, you dig in a little stone piece on the edge, fill it up, put these panels and the, the panels can go back to the mainland on a boat. And you can change the c configuration and for the public buildings just add the panels different configurations. So the finished uh, product of it. Uh, so we realize that it's really important to actually learn not only an architecture that is sensitive, but an architecture that's temporary in, nat in nature. So we started building buildings which are really temporary, which had footprints sometimes of just six months, a year. This is again for the Taj and Sri Lanka. Uh, it's a little uh, restaurant on the beach in Bentota. This is for the Taj in, um, in Goa. Again, a very simple building that costs just nine lakhs uh, totally, including the furniture, lighting, everything. And this building earns 50,000 rupees profit a night. So within two weeks, they've covered the whole cost of the building, you know, in terms of building. So you suddenly, that's a, that's a great way of actually constructing because you've covered the cost of your building in no time at all. And again, you can see the, 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 the lights are PVC pipes, drill little holes in them, painted blue. It cost us 11 rupees to make each, each lamp. <coughs> But sometimes it doesn't mean that you have to even build. This is a project that we, asked, we were appointed for Maharashtra Tourism Deport Department uh, to build a 40-room hotel. And we went there, and the land was really beautiful. And it had this very nice village. There were fisher folk over there, farmers over there. And a lot of the land went in CRZ, so they couldn't really build anything pakka. So we said, well, instead of building anything, why don't we give tourism to the people? So we decided that you know, for the fisher folk, let's create, like you have in Kerala, the rice boats. Can we create these floating platforms? where people can, can stay in and you can bring them all together if you want them as a single hotel or you can separate them. So we designed these little platforms which uh, could be on this backwaters over there. And then for the farmers of the village, we, we measured all the houses in the village. We proposed how they can actually make homestays and things. So become so 40 rooms in different houses and how they could form a cooperative. And all the money that would otherwise have gone into building a 40-room hotel would instead go into developing the infrastructure, developing their, their marketplace, their place of worship, their, their beach facilities, their jetties. All that money would go. And the tourism would be there. They, instead of working as waiters and bartenders, they would actually become the hosts of the village, running their own hotel virtually. So when we started working on Jungle Nudge Plus, we said we must imbibe the same principles of, of getting the community involved. So this is for uh, coffee day. This is the Sarai in Bandipur. Again, we, we got the men of the village to actually build. So the stonework is all built locally. The thatchwork is all built locally by the people in that traditional style of building. That's the restaurant area and the rooms over there. In in Pench, uh, for the Taj, there were the existing structure, the cabin thing we see in the white, and we wanted to add a little pavilion to make it more sensitive. So we added this, uh, these machans. So in the forest, you get a lot of trees that have fallen down. So we added this wooden cabins, little made out of fallen trees that became pavilions in the jungle. And uh, so we had the, the sleeping area above and the, the bathrooms down. This is in in Bandavgarh, again, using mud structures, but they double wall the insulators. They've got thick insulation in it, and uh, very simple structures. It doesn't feel like it's architect design, and the mud walls are built by the men. The women actually decorated. We bought all the artifacts in the village, all the crafts in the village, and incorporated it. That's the inside of the structure, all built-in beds into the place. You can see it's all, but it's got air conditioning behind it. It's another lodge in, in uh, the Satpura range, again, traditionally responding to local materials, local traditions in the thing. And every lodge is different, the waterfront, hillfront, all each having a different approach and plan to it. Yeah. That's the inside, again, using local craft in the area. This is in the Kurg area, again, a hotel on the waterfront. But here, responding to a more traditional colonial sort of architecture to it. So everywhere we work, we try and be responsible and responsive to the materials and the, the local styles of construction and that are available. This is out of Bhopal, again, like a very village-like, it's a very exclusive hotel, but it's done like a little village with these little pavilions of, of courtyards where you enter the thing, and each room has got their own pavilion which overlooks a productive landscape. So they, all they, they grow their whole food, 
all the food for the hotel and that's the entrance to the, the different rooms. Looks like little, and that's the reception area in it. Yeah. And the pavilion. Again, the, the corridor is just simple stone, bamboo on top, just stuck into the ground. <coughs> that's a tree house we just finished, which again, which is using local wood material around. And that's our office in the jungle, almost like a tree house on its own. Uh, it's at the, we're at the edge of a forest. And um, that's the entrance to the office and the inside of the office. We have our own, the punkas that you see over there. Of course, we've made electric motors for them. And they cool the office. And that's the three buildings we have as our office. So we have the architectural studio on one side. We have the product and studio on the other side. And in the middle is the design center. So for many years, for about seven years, we ran this building as an interpretation center of trying to get people together to, un to make a difference through design. So we had movies, talks, presentations, workshops happening at the design center. And while it was successful, we realized that there's something more that's needed you know, to get design. Because design to most people in the world becomes very exclusive. They say, oh, design, I, I don't know anything. I can't draw. Therefore, I, I don't need to come over there. So you realize that the issues of sustainability facing the world today are so important, and yet they're not addressed. So therefore, we felt that if we actually morph the design center into something that's more responsive, so that's, that's our architectural office as the design center on the left, uh, which we've now called Sensible Earth. So Sensible Earth is an initiative a few friends have got together. And we said we have to now address the issues of what the world is facing today. So it's not just about architecture. It's about water. It's about food. It's about energy. It's about building communities. It's about dealing with waste. And um, so that's the main building. It's a very simple building which actually uh, overlooks uh, the valley. We drive electric cars. So that's the little formation of the building. So we're going to have co-working spaces where people, young people can come be mentored on these various areas where experts in the field of water, energy, waste would come and, and have conduct workshops in it. Um, they're, they're co-working spaces. There are uh, workshop areas, conference rooms. Um, actually hands-on to make stuff over there. There's an eco-cafe. And we have about 20,000 square feet of land, open land, uh, which we're doing co-working pods in the thing, little jungle pods and thing. So sensible earth is really what we, what we want to achieve in some way of, of creating an ecosystem that enables, encourages, and practices and sustainability. And it's a collective, really. So we're trying to get people, open it out to as many people as we can, and deal with the issues uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not something which is in the air. It's something which is real. A lot of issues on sustainability are addressed on the net, where people meet on the net, say a few words, pass on a few videos, but nobody's coming together and meeting. So we need a physical space where we still rely on the virtual space and the digital space. We need a physical space where people can come together, connect, see each other, and make a difference to, uh, to the earth. So Sensible Earth, we didn't want to use the word sustainability, because sustainability is so misused today that people, the moment you say sustainable, yes, you'll get one lead point over here. Yes, I've, my plywood has got a green rating, I'm sustainable. Or I'm, when I brush my teeth, I turn off the tap, I'm sustainable. You know, so those are the things that are, are really from the past. We need much deeper solutions today, solutions that can really be effective. And the best way to do it is to get young people on board, because they can make a difference. And they are going to be affected in what's happening in the world in the future. So it's important that young people come on board and make a difference. So this is our initial initiative. And a lot of this, I realize, has come from, from Baker's teaching in a way, where he, he again, was a very down-to-earth person and a very sensible person. So sensible earth, I think, is the very appropriate way of doing things. And that's our little office in the jungle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a very ins inspirational talk. Now, the session is open to the audience for questions. Sir, yeah. Sir, for sensible earth paradigm, how far James Lovelock's uh, uh, Gaia hypothesis, seeing the entire earth as an organism, yeah. is applicable there? And, and my next question is, how uh, what can we say the Baker unique style of architecture yeah. 
a tropical kind of frugal innovation or jugad a frugal means from surroundings he get the materials and he recycle it so it is a sort of jugad or frugal innovation specific to india because even though his background is british he, he, he how to what extent british architecture influences him in his indigenization of local architecture in india so i think one one thing we have to remember when we look at local architectures we need to see firstly what are the learnings from it you know we need to see so it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to build a typical you know building that looks exactly like what was in the past there may be materials like wood which may be in short supply there may be other issues which are of uh, that we need to address in some system so like roofing systems you have the, the old tiles in the old days now the tiles have certain also issues with it so there may be some new materials which can perform even better than traditional materials that we need to recognize and take on board and now understanding of technology in the old days people did it you know, without uh, realizing it was almost like a natural thing to do so whether it was building a thick wall whether it was putting a little dormer vent in the top of the thing to let the hot air out it was common practice to do it but today because we think we've got air conditioners because we've got other cooling systems mechanical cooling systems that we can do what we want so it's important to go back to the learnings of those buildings and see what is the the essential parts uh, that the realizations and capture the traditional wisdom that we had and i think what baker did in terms of you know even though he was an english architect he had a, his approach was very pragmatic he was very direct in his thing and he just interpreted what it is we look at places like bali for example now bali again was it a beautiful architecture that was there in the past and there were few people from outside who came a lot of people from australia who came moved to bali and they saw the great potential of its architecture but they started tweaking the architecture a little they started changing the sensibilities a little especially for the hospitality projects that came up in bali and you can see the great wealth that they added also to the architect because they brought in a different sensibility in a similar way it's it's good that people work like i enjoy working in the jungle even though the materials are different when i was a, given a project to do in ladakh i was excited to it but i realized i was out of my depth because i never worked in the cold climate but i was out of my depth but i was willing to learn from what ladakh had to offer so when i went to ladakh ladakh for example uh, the main roofing system are those um, um, the poles i forget the name of the wood so these um, poles uh, willow tree poles and they vary from 3 meters to 5 meters yeah, in length yeah. so first thing is not take you think okay 3 meters 5 meters i'll use average i'll use 4 meter thing i'll keep a, a 4 by 4 meter grid and i said what if i have to use all the poles yeah? how can i use all the poles so i designed a trapezoidal grid where i use all the poles from 3 meters slowly increasing to 5 meters and i alternate the grid so i could turn this this 3 to 5 here and then 5 to 3 here so i could get a straight building by crisscrossing the thing as it went along it went and i could use all the poles or if i wanted to do a circle i'd use it like this and it turn it little and i could actually start bending the building as well and all that came from the need to use everything so we put these constraints on us ourselves and not just use it directly as as we do almost like an engineering thing of without applying your mind without saying doesn't matter that will go to waste i don't i don't care but we keep this factor that we cannot waste that we have to be sensible that we have to put that extra f thinking effort into it can we get architecture that is responsible in a way sir uh, good afternoon sir uh, sir can we construct high rise buildings uh, in a more sustainable manner in such a way that we get well, uh, less debris uh, after, uh, when we demolish it so I'll, i haven't shown you a slide because it didn't look anything like a baker building but we worked on a building in in delhi in noida where we did a hollow column is not built as yet but the hollow column hollow beam system which can go up to 10 stories also so the idea in normal building you build a framework then you clad your services on it in this building the services ran through the structural system so you could run all your your services of power uh, water sewage air conditioning everything through the hollow column so you could get it exactly where you want it in terms of services aspect and the building is is designed completely dismantled the floors are just steel frames uh, with stone slabs sitting on neoprene pads so you can dismantle the whole building you can change the whole plan of the building you can sell the building after you finish the use of and with the price of steel going up you can sell the building for more than it cost you to build it so we realize whereas most buildings the moment you life is over you demolish it it only goes into landfill so this building is designed that after the use of the building you can either change it or you can just sell it the way it is and you get more value for it 
So it's, it's those sort of sensibilities that you have to put. The, so no one's against high-rise buildings. But with going high-rise, you also have the issues of, you know, taking water up, taking, you know, people up. So generally, most people, in a, as Benny also said, you know, look at a high-density, low-rise configuration. And they found that about five stories is the best level to get five, maximum six stories. To give you the maximum density and <clears throat> uh, the maximum height should be that. Because you don't have to uh, spend too much on mechanical systems. And you're more connected to the ground. So high rise you know, is maybe iconic. A lot of people keep on fire. Well, my building is higher than you know, that building. And it's taller. But after a certain point, it gets. Plus, also today, a lot of the high rise, Gurgaon now, because of the water extraction in the ground, should there be an earthquake, a lot of the high rises are going to fall down because the ground has become unstable. So it may be good today, but the moment you have other factors coming in, and the world is going to face more and more earthquakes as we go along, more and more droughts. So high rises are going to be vulnerable. We're going to be spending a lot more keeping them going. The high rise in Bombay, 10 story building for the slum dwellers, the lifts are not working, water's not working, and poor people stay in these you know, decrepit apartments. So it's, it's very unfair to actually put low pe uh, pe poor people in, in high-rise buildings. Eh? So even though it may, they think it's low cost, but the only thing low cost is freeing up land for other valuable for the rich. Eh? So we have to make sure that the poor actually, even though they may stay in smaller apartments, need open space, need ground space for their livelihoods. Eh? Pardon me? So alternative building technologies, provided it's appropriate, is well worth it, especially if it incorporates waste in a big way. So I think we're facing a major problem in waste uh, today. So people are looking at very innovative ways of dealing with waste, how do we recycle building materials, how do we create materials which can be you know, recycled easily. And uh, a lot of argument now from mining and everything today is that we need to build, have more cars, we need to have more houses and everything. But if you see the amount of waste material that we have actually today in, available in the world, it's quite a bit. And now throughout Europe, they, they hardly look at greenfield projects. I went to Stockholm the other, a few years ago, and Stockholm has built a full new city in an old industrial estate. They say we're not going to industrial. So they recycle all the sheds of the thing, make it into you know, commercial buildings. Then they built new buildings over there, but they're not more than five story. And that's all closed loop systems. You know, the water, the energy, the food, everything comes locally. And there's only one train that goes from, from, the, uh, from this town to Stockholm that keeps on going. Nobody uses cars over there. It's walkable, all walkable distance. So they recognize the need to, to remove automobiles from the system, to create public transport. And it's, it's a really effective way. So even people living in the third floor of a building have a piece of land. They have collective gardens over there. So they can actually have their own patch of land where they grow their own vegetables and things. So it's important that people share resources and things. That's, that's the, the best solution that you can have rather than build individual houses. Okay. My question was something different. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yesterday our chief minister was, you know, uh, promoting, uh, endorsing prefabricated building technology, yeah. you know, which can be called a composite or alternative building solution. So I would like to know uh, what is your take on that? So actually we worked with uh, Dan Aid, which is the Danish aid agency, on a prefab system for India about 15 years ago. And we went around to all the big developers uh, across the country uh, who are building, including the Tatas, the people in Chennai and everything. And nobody is prepared for prefab because prefab over the years has had a very bad name because the earlier prefab systems that we used, like Shirke and everything, had very poor quality to it. So nobody wanted to touch it. Prefab today has increased tremendously. Yes, it increases speed, but it has to be a hybrid system because in prefab, <clears throat> the big advantage is that you can do industrial production in a factory, so your quality is much less. But what you don't take into account is you have to design it extra for transport. The moment you make, have to transport it, it has to be designed much stronger because of breakage on the way, handling on the way, things can chip. So prefab system is good to a certain extent, beyond which you need to localize. But the main thing we need today is actually empower people. For centuries, we have all built ourselves. You know, our great-grandfather, there was no architect, no engineer. Everyone built themselves. So most housing was done locally. OK, maybe high, you know, multi-story buildings need people. But we need to empower local population to build. And that's what Baker almost did in a way. You know, getting people to understand it's a very simple technology, and therefore we can build ourselves. So we as architects need to, rather than make an exclusive you know, profession, is make it an inclusive profession of getting people to learn how to build simple structures 
on their own. So you don't need prefab to be low cost. People can build themselves, they can take. In Croatia, after the destruction that took place, or the bombing and the war that took place, the UN stepped in, they wanted to rebuild the city. And they thought, how do we do this? If you have to hire contractors, it's going to cost so much more. So at every crossroad, they put sand, cement, stones, everything over there. And they had classes for people, taught people how to build, how to build stone walls, how to plaster, how to do electrical wiring, how to do plumbing. And the people built it themselves. And the people will build much better than any contractor, because they know it's theirs. They have a certain pride in doing it, you know? So sudden, and nobody, when you dump sand cement every, on every crossroad, there's so much, why would you even want to rob it over there? Because <laughs> it's, it's just available down the road again. So they, they halve the cost of construction by just getting people to rebuild their own city. So we have to look at innovative ways in which we can bring the cost down. And, and we talk about sustainability. The first principle of sustainability is low cost, is bringing the cost down. Once you bring the cost down, you're almost automatically becoming sustainable. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful session with very